they are going to be discussing lights, camera, color. I'll let everyone introduce themselves when they come to stage. Gentlemen, come on up. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Connor McGill with Baby Shelter Takes Care Of. Um, we are one of the sponsors of the event, and um, to use our sponsor time, um, I was thinking about uh, here on stage. I was thinking about what uh, what topics that we could cover that um, intersect with the Sarah feature set, but also um, you know have are, are topical, interesting. So I was of course attracted to the most fraught, esoteric, contentious, subjective kind of um, thing that I come into contact with these days, which is color and light uh, in the context of LED-based virtual production. So. The, the topic of the panel discussion today is, is that um, I, uh, as, a, as a representative of a manufacturer of one of the pieces of equipment that's involved with uh, LED virtual production, um, I, as a second-hand source, hey. I am, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I, I have many, many uh, second-hand data points, and uh, most of those data points are speaking with people who are practitioners, who are virtual producers, who uh, own studios or um, uh, you run LED studios like this one. And some of the most exciting um, and kind of original ideas that I've come, come across have been from these, these fine folks here um, who, who don't work for Pixera. They are uh, their friends and colleagues from across the industry. So um, to start, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, and then I'll, I'll little, frame the discussion a little bit more and ask some questions. So I'll start with you, Ben, if you'd like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your relevant experience. Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Dynas. Um, I came from the film TV world. I was a lighting programmer for 15 years doing movies, commercials, music videos, TV shows for high-end cli clients, Marvel, DC, Sony, Apple, that type of stuff. Um, I got involved into the manufacturing side about eight years ago. I worked for a company called Quasar Science, uh, manufacturing LED lights, and really got heavy into the lighting control side and the technology side that had to do with film production. Um, from there, um, I was involved with the Unreal Fellowship um, for ICBFX, getting deeper into the virtual production side. And really, we started to embrace what we call image-based lighting, um, which I think is part of what we're going to talk about here. Um, along with my, uh, my cohort, Tim Kang, at Quasar Science, um, we really delved into that and, and tried to, yeah, you give it up for Tim if you know him, um, uh, delve into the, 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 the technology side of how you approach that. Um, recently, um, I joined the team at Aperture Lighting, and uh, I brought Tim Kang along with me uh, now at Aperture Lighting, and there we are, we are trying to push forward um, lighting control, push forward virtual production lighting, because the big topic that we talk about a lot in virtual production is the, the environment that we create with the volume. And even if the LED volume gets better in quality with, with uh, you know, better spectrum and things like that, we'll still need to light the set. You'll still need the hard lights. You'll still have to approach it in the same way uh, for lighting. So there you go. Thanks, Ben. Marcus? Thank you, Ben. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, my name is Marcus, um, and I don't have a background in lighting. Um, I have a background in um, computer science, actually. That's really how I started my career in this in this business. Uh, however, I did run into Ben in my previous previous job, um, where I was representing a company called Lumen Radio, who produces uh, solutions for wireless DMX control. So that's how I kind of entered into the lighting industry and started understanding the the requirements and the needs from a lighting perspective, especially especially in cinema and, and, and TV. Then I stumbled on a couple of banana peels and ended up with a company, uh, another media server company called Disguise, and worked with that company for quite some time, producing uh, solutions with uh, my then old friend Ben and and other uh, lighting professionals in the in the film and TV industry, um, and now with a company called uh, Regional Syndicate, um, and we position ourselves as a studio innovation company where we uh, produce innovative solutions for uh, specifically for virtual production, um, and one of my areas of expertise or uh, 
necessarily expertise, but that I find myself uh, in more than often than not is really figuring out how do we control traditional lighting fixtures with modern day media servers. Thank you. Andy. Hello. 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 Uh, my name is Andy. I am a uh, virtual production supervisor. Aha. Uh -huh. I'll give you that one. Uh, my name is Andy. I'm a virtual production supervisor. I'm based in Chicago. Um, I also come at this from the sort of film and TV industry. Um, I started off uh, over 10 years ago now as a camera assistant, and then um, I became a union special effects supervisor for many years. I got into virtual production uh, around 2019, and um, I've been a uh, serial developer, uh, tinkerer throughout all that time. I currently run a company called Low Lead Virtual, which um, is a sort of R&D and consultancy company based in Chicago for virtual production. And I also run a company called Smash Virtual, which is the largest uh, LED volume in the Midwest. And um, I am someone who has just always been super into filmmaking tools and technology and the science behind it um, and developing uh, new and exciting ways and trying to learn as much as I can about all of this stuff. Thank you, Andy. Excellent. So. Uh, to, to ground the conversation, I'd really like to um, connect the, this topic with the ethos of uh, framework or live pixel people. So, Marcus, starting with you, could you give us a little bit of the uh, genesis of the use of LED, direct view LED tiles in uh, the film and TV production world and kind of what the, the state of play with that technology is and what you think some of the uh, main benefits are over conventional, either green screen or on location, uh, practical studio shooting? Those are many questions in one. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> Feel where, free where to choose we, any uh, part of it that you'd like. Where do we start? No, I, I think, I mean, um, I think if we look to the, the history of virtual production or the history of, of, of uh, image based lighting, I think it's sitting right in front of us here. Like, um, everybody who's in this audience has been part of uh, taking the technology and create, taking the, the storytelling tools that we have to our disposal today um, to where they are today. Um, but I think if we, if we look uh, back in time where this, this whole thing started, like if any of you were here during the Sympathy event yesterday, there was a very good presentation by Lux Machina on how they've pushed the, the envelope, starting with using um, projection mapping back in, I think, I believe 2013 when they did um, Oblivion. That was a full wraparound of, of um, using projectors instead of LED. Um, and then obviously we moved from there into using more LED and initially only as backgrounds for work that was done in camera as a replacement to green screen. Um, and then during that time, I feel like we were still just uncovering some of the problems. Uh, we still are uncovering some problems on a day-to-day -day basis. But we, we were then uncovering some of the problems that came with using these direct view LED video walls or whatever we want to uh, choose to call them today as light sources, right? They are uh, narrow spectrum LED. They are meant to be viewed with a camera. They're not meant to be used as light sources. Um, I think that's really where the whole transition into using more traditional lighting fixtures in, uh, w as a combination or as a, as a augmentation rather uh, to the LED screens uh, really came about. Um, but at that point, we still hadn't really figured out how do we integrate these things into holistic workflow? How do we use the same imagery that is being used to uh, display on the LED screens to also power our, uh, or control our, our, our lighting fixtures. So that's really where the push into interactive image-based lighting started. I think that was probably back in 20, 2019, 2020, um, when we started uh, moving in that direction. Um, there's still quite a bit to go in terms of interoperability and um, making sure that um, a lighting fixture understands color uh, color and lighting data that exist inside a video file in a in a sensible way, but I feel that we're we're um, definitely moved quite a bit in the right direction. Excellent, thank you. So picking up on the thread there, just talking about some of the the, the technical dimension of LED tiles being narrow spectrum RGB. Andy, could you tell us a little bit about some of the 
the, the, the challenges that you face in your LED volume related to that? Yeah, absolutely. So the issue that you're going to run into when you're using an LED panel as a light source is something called metamerism, which is a phenomenon in which two objects, which are different colors, can appear to be the same color under certain lighting conditions, which is a very vague definition because metamerism is a, it's a big concept. It's been known about since the mid-1800s. It's a sort of core pillar of color vision and color imagery in general. Practically speaking, in the virtual production standpoint, what it how it sort of manifests itself is if you have an object that reflects a very specific part of the color spectrum. Well, LED panels only emit three colors, right? Red, green, and blue. And that works for our eyes and for cameras because they only see red, green, and blue. But an object can absorb and reflect any arbitrary amount of wavelengths. So if you have an object that very specifically reflects, say, yellow light, you're not illuminating it with yellow light. You're only giving it red, green, and blue. And so in sort of the best case scenario, you have an object like human skin, which absorbs and reflects a multitude of colors. And so it just sort of results in things looking a little bit off and, and just not quite as pleasing or as accurate. And in very extreme scenarios, you can actually wind up with a situation where the object looks just black because you're simply not giving it any light that it can then reflect back at you. And so this is um, something that I, I think often gets overlooked because it is something of a technical thing. But the issue is that it manifests itself in kind of the worst possible scenarios, like when we're shooting products, right? A client wants a product to look as accurate as possible. They invested a lot of time and money in that specific color and that manufacturing process to maintain that color. And so you uh, then illuminate it with a light source that isn't providing the full spectrum. It's not going to give you the accurate color and it's gonna cause a problem. Um, so this is where you know image-based lighting, this is where using just actual studio lighting fixtures to augment that. Um, and even the new, you know, like Brompton um, technologies with integrating RGBW pixels are going to be, uh, you know, really helpful. Great. That's fantastic. That's, uh, thank you. So to continue on with this idea of image-based lighting, first of all, for those in the room who don't know, I was wondering, Ben, if you maybe could define that and then talk a little bit about some of the technologies that you've been involved in developing to address the issues that Andy has brought up. Sure, yeah. When, when you're creating uh, an LED volume, what you're essentially doing is you're making a, a big giant soft source of the world around you. So when you're creating this world around you, it's, it's all soft light. And um, as Andy just described, it is all uh, very spiky spectrum soft light. And so the way that you could combat that is to put the same type of imagery, the same video wall, the same content. Instead of running that through the wall, you can actually run that through lights. Well. There's an interesting thing that's happened over the past, well, it's probably happened forever in technology, where a problem occurs on set, the existing technology is used to try to solve that problem, and you kind of get there, you, you get to a point that you're like, oh, I, this kind of works, but then you can iterate the technology further, and you iterate the technology further, and you solve that problem, but guess what? There's another problem that occurs, so now you iterate again and again. And image-based lighting has only really come about because the technology has been able to now do this, right? Before, we could just light with a big white panel and a different color of a white panel or pixelate the panel. Um, but now, with the pixelation that we get in the LED walls, the pixelation that we get in LED products and LED lighting that actually have, you know, five, six, seven colors, we can create that same environment in a soft light but now we have full spectrum lighting or as close to full spectrum lighting as we can. And so with the research that we did at Quasar Science, we, were, we figured out the right pixel size to do that because if the pixel is actually too small, the, lights, the light actually starts to get a little muddy. It doesn't really get that interactivity that you want off on an LED volume. You don't get that interactivity if the pixels are too small. So you really have to find a way to do the interactivity with the right size pixels to get that environment to, uh, to you know, affect your actor. Because in a volume, there's really two aspects um, of believability that you have. It's what is the actor touching, like a prop, uh, a bridge that they're on that extends in the background, you know, something physical that's repeated in the environment, what they're touching, and then what's touching them. And the only thing really touching them is the lighting at that point. So you have to have that really be the same quality of the cinema lights that we've used for a while. And you get that with the with image-based lighting because you could send that media to the pixelated array to create that in your environment. Excellent. That is amazing. So this all sounds great, like we solved the problem. But Done. Marcus, you've said some interesting things to me about 
uh, a you know the deficiency of DMX uh, and and because these image-based lighting fixtures are typically still communicated with via DMX over SACN or ArtNet. So if you could speak a little bit about the the, the deficiency of DMX and also um, you, you had already mentioned in the conversation uh, the the ability of these fixtures to interpret video data in a semi-simple way. If you could elaborate on that a little bit too, that's that's interesting to me. Sure, absolutely, I'd love to. We only have nine minutes left, so. <laughs> uh, but I think- We'll yeah, just be over here just continuing to talk off yeah, mic. Exactly. The, um, the deficiencies of DMX, I mean, it's it's uh, that's a it's a topic that we can probably um, talk about for, for a very, very, very long time. DMX, uh, even though it's, it's still heavily used, right, in, in, the, in the shape of running down a 5-pin five, five RS-485 cable as ArtNet or as streaming ACN, I mean, it has many different names, but um, ultimately it all suffers from the same deficiencies. It's a unidirectional protocol. It doesn't carry any metadata. It doesn't carry any contextual information whatsoever. Um, it doesn't support the uh, highest frame rate that we're today using, like DMX is limited to 44 hertz refresh rate. If you're within one universe of, of, um, of DMX, um, it doesn't support uh, synchronization, for example. Uh, today, we are, everything around us is genlocked. There's no way we would be able to genlock a traditional DMX controlled light. Um, that's only the start. Um, if we then look at the applications that we're using DMX for today in terms of controlling lights with, not necessarily with a console anymore, but we're using a media server to, to, to drive the lights. We're playing back video, uh, videos that may uh, include HDR content. HDR content that is calibrated to a specific uh, peak brightness, etc. There's no way for us to actually tell the light in a smart way what to do. Um, so in, in, in a way, and it's a little bit ironic that we're sitting in a, in a scenario where we have so much control over how we control our video devices, right? We have control over uh, what color space we're using between the media server and the processor. We have control over um, exactly how every single pixel on these LED tiles around us are, are behaving on a microsecond level. But on the lighting side, which we depend on so much in order to actually uh, create the believable uh, product, we don't have that level of control. And I feel that is something that, as an industry, we need to start asking uh, tougher questions, uh, both to manufacturers on, on both sides, but also to the standardization bodies to, to ensure that, that we get to a point where we have the same level of control over lighting fixtures as we do with, with video devices. May I counterpoint? You can go for it, absolutely. Yes. Well, uh, I'd just like to say that, yes, DMX does have all the de those deficiencies. As, as a lighting manufacturer, and you know, DMX has been my world for the past 20 years or so, um, we have, we've been coming up with ways to overcome this, as you know. Um, SAC and multicast, um, it, it's the best form of DMX, even though it is Ethernet-based protocols. Um, uh, because at, at the end of the line, uh, you know, DMX is still 512 channels. It's still, it still gets uh, conveyed in that way. And when you get into these highly pixelated lights, they're instantly a universe of DMX. Um, so I think as a lighting manufacturer and as, as a programmer, um, you know, I think the responsibility is gonna, gonna come to how do we improve this? Because a lot of the governing bodies that regulate the protocols, um, by the time the manufacturers are ready for something new, the last protocol is finally getting pushed out. So I think we have to iterate faster, and I think we have to try more things. And what's really interesting about virtual production is since it's this constant state of experimentation and find the workflow and there's not one way to do things, I think it's providing a more fertile ground to experiment. And so as a manufacturer, I think we have to keep pushing that. And the way that we push it as a manufacturer is through people using it and the users and you know the professionals like yourselves out there discovering the new problems, pushing people to find the solutions so that we can make better tools to, to use, essentially. Fabulous. So Andy, as somebody who runs a stage day in and day out, what are some of your thoughts on the, the current state of the image-based lighting workflow versus conventional lighting control, and um, do you, where do you hope it goes from here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was saying uh, earlier that I think kind of brought me here as sort of the foil to the image-based lighting conversation because our experiences with it so far have been uh, somewhat mixed just as far as the state of the technology and where it's at. 
I think that this is something I see a lot in the virtual production space, but a lot of companies sort of operate in this vacuum of virtual production and the, the solutions to problems they come up with only sort of work in, in the virtual production context. But it's important to remember that the tools that we make are being integrated into a production workflow, a very well-established production workflow that's used every single day all around the world. And if the tools that we, we make are not uh, readily able to be integrated into that, then it's gonna, always going to be a struggle, and it's always going to be difficult to get people to adopt them. Um, it is tough. People in the film industry uh, don't like to change. They don't like new things. It's not an industry that is conducive to taking risks, and so you kind of have to sort of trick people into trying out new things by making sure that it's highly interoperable with the way that they're already used to working. So when it comes to image-based lighting, um, the, the current state of the art sort of completely removes a lot of control that cinematographers and that lighting programmers had previously had and replaces it with driving it with a video. And the thing is that the videos are not shot most often with the intention of being used as light sources. They're meant to be viewed directly. And so often you want to be able to make tweaks. You want to be able to change things. The cinematographer wants to be able to make creative decisions. And right now it's very difficult to do um, with the current state of the art. It's, it's not always easy to make those changes. And that's really frustrating for creative uh, folks. Absolutely. And Ben, actually, you've, you've said, you've given me some really interesting insight to uh, on-set dynamics with the kind of the, the, the politics of the shifting, the tectonic shift. And could you maybe speak a little bit about that and where you see the opportunity is to kind of uh, educate or indoctrinate, if you will? Um, yeah, with... Central lighting people? We, we, sure. Uh, with, with the image-based lighting um, concept, you know, and, and even using LED walls as light source, it, it's come down to who's in control of that. Is the DIT changing the color, the color or the color space of the LED wall on the fly? Does it go to the lighting programmer? It really ultimately comes back to the why are, why are we doing this? What's the creative decision that's being made? Um, you know, either the director or the DP or the VAD team, how are, we, how are we arriving at this decision? And to come to this conclusion normally dictates how it's going to be controlled on set. And I think um, as we keep pushing further and as virtual production uh, comes down in cost, it, it will really help it to, uh, for image-based lighting to kind of spread out to like Andy's point, um, to, to kind of spread out and be more widely adopted because it's not just a virtual production mm, yeah, tool, good point. Um, but it has to come from the creative side. They have to be able to justify the expense uh, ultimately to use it. Yeah, excellent. So um, we're almost at the end of time. I uh, invite, if anybody has any questions, uh, I don't know if there's a mic or if any of the panelists have any closing thoughts, um, I would invite them now. You have two minutes to ask questions. Two, okay. Let's. Anybody have any questions? Otherwise, we can end early. Sure. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm Brandon. Uh, I've worked with Tim actually quite a bit at a stage up in Seattle for some image-based lighting using Pixar, all that stuff. And one of the things that we had kind of briefly talked about, and coming from like LED world, I'm from I'm more like DP camera lighting is like all I care about for that stuff. And something we were talking about was like. Is there a potential of, because like that studio in Seattle, I'm having issues where like the LD is like super nervous about all the image-based lighting because he's using, he's losing a lot of control. And one of the things about that is like all these lights that he wants to use obviously are not, they're not calibrated to the same color spectrums. Every light manufacturer has their own color spectrums they're in. Uh, and like I do Calman and stuff and is there a potential of doing something like that, almost like a LUT based, to bring all these lights into one, like an ACES workflow, right, for lighting? Uh, yeah. There's that was a question I was going to ask you, Marcus. We ran out yeah, of about standing. That's a really good question. Okay, Please. thank you. Um, there is actually been some, some work done um, in the, um, it's called the ASC MITSI, it's the um, American Society of Cinematographers. Um, we're working on producing recommendations and best practices to lighting manufacturers on how do you calibrate your uh, lighting fixtures to a specific video-based uh, color space, Rec. 709, Rec. 2020, and so on and so forth. And also recommendations on standardization around DMX profiles that will make it easier to control multiple fixtures from multiple different uh, manufacturers uh, using the same profile and you have a higher degree of predictability. Yeah, the, the first step of that is is we're doing a push to get everybody just to start with Rec. 709 because typically an RGB profile um, is it, that when you when you set the light to full red, that's what the manufacturer's decision of what red is. There's no standard for that. So if we could first decide, make me an RGB profile that's 16-bit, 
that is in Rec 709, I think that's a great place to start um, to, to solve those problems because previously when you were doing image-based lighting, and the, the issue was this doesn't match. I, I went and pixel mapped in these lights and it's way too saturated. Now I gotta do all these changes to it to try and make it fit that what I'm trying to achieve. Well, it's because it's, it doesn't have a color space yet. So that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. Well, clearly proving fertile ground for continued conversation. So uh, I invite anybody who wants to continue the conversation to see us out in the lobby, but I'll throw it back to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you panelists. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>